There's this myth, the market goes up, the market goes down. That's not really true. So how do I know who the person is to help me build my wealth plan? Like, how do I identify that person? Stay disciplined, keep investing, focus on the long run. You know, really wealthy people are not watching financial media around the clock and making moves based on that. So people are just trying to time the market and they end up losing. That's exactly right. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a true legend in the house here, Mr. Peter Malouk. If you don't know his name yet, he has written two books with this guy, Mr. Tony Robbins. If you have read the best-selling book, Unshakable, you'll see here at the bottom with Peter Malouk, and, and the subheadline here is, ranked the number one wealth advisor in the U.S. for three consecutive years by Barron's. He started Creative Planning, uh, which manages $55 billion dollars in assets if you can believe that's crazy and he's got a new book out with tony called the path which is going to help you accelerate your journey to financial freedom peter maluk welcome aboard man hey good to be with you evan so you've worked with so many successful people the richest of the rich who have figured out financial freedom what do they know that the average joe doesn't know about getting financial freedom I think the average Joe thinks that it's a system that can be gamed like everything else. And I think what really wealthy people have figured out is it's really about discipline and a pattern. Putting money away in a disciplined way, no matter what's going on in various asset classes and letting time work on your side. So I think about it like the reverse of gambling. Like most people, when they go to a casino and gamble, some people think they can beat that casino if they learn everything. But really, if you play perfectly, the odds are you're going to lose. And right. the longer you play, the longer the odds you're going to lose. Well, investing, if you do it right, you're the house, you're the casino. You might lose on any given day. Uh, the odds you, you invest in the stock market and you lose in one day is about 50-50. But if you're invested for a year, the odds you win are 75%. If you're invested for three years, it's about 93%. And so what wealthy people have figured out is it's time is your friend. So stay disciplined, keep investing, focus on the long run. You know, really wealthy people are not watching financial media around the clock and making moves based on that. It's interesting what you just said, because a lot of people would think that putting money in the stock market is gambling. Yeah, that, that's the narrative for a lot of America. So you just said, no, it's not. It's you're the house. So just break that down for us. Explain a little more. Well, I think the, there's this myth. The market goes up, the market goes down. But that's not really true. Uh, it's like saying the casino wins, the casino loses. The, the casino wins or loses on any given hand or any given spin of the roulette wheel. But over time, the casino wins. And over time, the market goes up. So the longer you're in the market, the more you have that on your side. So let's just take a horrible investor. They invested the day before COVID started. They're positive today. If they invested uh, before 9-11, they're positive today. Before the tech bubble, before 809, and not a little bit positive, they've doubled or tripled their money over some of those entry points. If you're the worst investor in the world, you invested before some of those terrible events, eventually the market moves up. And you know we can relate that with the products. The stock market is rep representative of products. Apple, we have our iPhone and everything else. And with McDonald's, we can get a meal. And with Netflix, we get the streaming service. And we know, like if we buy a Hershey's bar today, that it will probably cost more 10 years from now. It certainly costs more to buy a Hershey's bar today than 10 years ago or 20 years ago, but we don't have confidence that Hershey's stock is going to go up. You know, we, we should look at it and go, if we expect this can of Diet Coke to go up in, in value, if it's going to cost more 10 years from now to buy than today, well, it makes sense that Coca-Cola stock will probably follow. And so we, we don't have a problem understanding how the market, the economy expands in terms of pricing and inflation, but we seem to think the market goes up and down. It's on a journey up and it takes pauses on the way up. It doesn't go up in a straight line, but it just heads that way over the long run. So people are just trying to time the market and they end up losing. That's exactly right. So one of the ways that you lose is you time. So uh, one of the, the record flow for outflows from the stock market this year was in March. So when the market was doing its worst, people took money out of the market and they went and bought bonds. And what a mess because the market's up you know, 30, 40% since then. S&P 500's recovered all of its losses. So someone timing that really made a mistake. And sometimes timing is not that dramatic. Sometimes it's as simple as, hey, I don't want to uh, invest now because I think the election, I need to wait for the election, or I'm waiting until 2021, or I'm waiting until coronavirus is gone. 
all of those things are market timing. And so they're all dangerous. That, that moving in and out like that, all of those moves are dangerous. The market has this upward trend. And if you get in the way of that, you're more likely to cause harm than good. I think people are also very fear driven. They don't understand the markets. They feel like I didn't go to school for this. I don't have a background in this. I worked hard for this money and I don't want it to risk losing it. What do you suggest for somebody? Where, where are they putting it? Is it finding the right planner? Is it buying an ETF? Is it picking your favorite stock? Is it throwing something at the dartboard? Like, <laughs> it's probably not your advice. What, what am I doing? What are we doing to get started? I think if somebody's starting out, they don't, they, they've just got some money. They got a, a few hundred dollars or a few thousand dollars. You should open an account at a place like Charles Schwab or Fidelity or Vanguard and go buy an index fund. Go buy the S&P 500. That's 500 stocks, uh, big U.S. companies. Think of Nike, McDonald's, uh, Google. You wind up owning a big basket of about 500 of those companies, really representative of the national economy. And you're just buying one thing. You're buying one index and you get all 500 or so of those stocks. So you get diversified across different industries. Uh, different types of businesses. And over time, that will work for you. About three out of four years will be positive, but over 10 years, it will almost certainly be positive and do better than your alternatives, like buying bonds or CDs or staying in cash. And when does it make sense for someone to go to an advisor for extra help? So I think like it, no matter how young you are, it makes sense to go pay an advisor by the hour and get some advice on laying out a roadmap. Because really the biggest gift an investor can have is time. Is somebody who's investing when they're in their 20s or 30s is so much better off than someone who's investing in their 50s. They can, they can invest one-fourth the amount and come out ahead because they've got time on their side. So if you can get some advice early from somebody who knows what they're doing about how to set up a Roth IRA, what to contribute to a Roth IRA, what investments to buy, what you should do with your 401k, that advice is it's the, be- the earlier you get it, the better. But you probably don't need to be paying for extremely sophisticated ongoing management until you get 50000 100000 or more. And you can benefit from owning a lot of different things. And so talk about that. So if somebody's got fifty to hundred k or maybe a little more, they're not in the billions yet. You know, it might be yeah. their aspiration to be able to retire with something good. What, what, what does the investment advisor help them with that's more active at the 50 hundred k that's going to actually make a big difference for them? So now you're going to own different asset classes. We need more than just the S&P 500. So we're going to maybe look at having a global portfolio. It might make sense to own bonds. It might make sense to own real estate. You have enough money that someone should be taking advantage of tax trades. Like if the market drops, selling things that are down and replacing them, you can, you can come up with the same return, but wind up with uh, a deduction on your tax return. They might rebalance the portfolio, which means selling things doing well and buying things doing poorly for you at, at times you might not have the discipline or time to do yourself. So for example, you know, in March of this year, our company creative planning was selling bonds and client portfolios and buying stocks while the stock market was down. So when the stock market recovers, our clients have more of that and they're able to get ahead than just holding through all of that. As so he starts to make sense to have those extra things to give you a little bit of an edge. How much of asset allocation for you is, market timing versus that client's position in life and how much of a, of a window they have in risk tolerance. To me, asset allocation is all about, you know, what are you trying to accomplish? So I, for, for your viewers, basically asset allocation is of your investments, of your assets, how are you going to allocate them? What are you going to put in the U.S.? What are you going to put overseas? What are you going to put in bonds? What are you going to put in stocks? Probably the biggest decision in all of asset allocation is what goes to stocks versus what goes to bonds. And bonds really have very low long-term returns, especially now when interest rates are so low. And so you really, to get where you want to go, you've got to own more stocks. But if you've got somebody who's retiring in a year or two, they can't be all stocks because stuff happens. You have coronavirus, 9-11, whatever, the market can get cut cut in half for any reason at any time. So you have to have something in short-term investments or safe investments, whether it's bonds or something bond-like, to make sure those short-term needs can get met. Uh, But otherwise, you really want stocks for the longer run. So I'm really a believer in doing things based on need, not based on age or risk tolerance. Not really saying we're going to have this much bonds and stocks because you're not a risky person or because you're, you're 32 or 52. Instead saying, how much do you have? How much are you saving? When do you need to take this money out? And is that going to change? And then picking the investments that have the highest chance of meeting those needs over time. And when you've got an entrepreneur, so most of my audience is going to be entrepreneurs, want to be entrepreneurs, established yeah. entrepreneurs. 
cash is often tight. Cash is often going into our baby, our business, yeah. trying to get it to the next yeah. step. At what point do you recommend like some strategies, right? Is it yeah. at the beginning, put everything in your business? Is it once we start making money, pull, pull a certain piece out? Is it from the beginning, save 10% and put it into something? Like what rules of thumb would you have for new entrepreneurs? You know, so what every entrepreneur wants to accomplish is to be free to do whatever they want, whenever they want to do it. And so they try to like invest in their business and do whatever they want, but they try to build a pool of money on the side that no matter what happens, they're set, their family's set for the rest of their life. So the dream scenario for an entrepreneur is, if they need you know, 100,000 a year to, to live adjusted for inflation, they might try to get a $2 million portfolio built up on the side so that whatever is happening in the world uh, with them, they can keep taking risks and doing all these dynamic things knowing they're secure. And it takes a long time to build that pile up, but it doesn't take a lot of money if you're starting you know, earlier. So I always encourage entrepreneurs, like you know, the way it works in the entrepreneur world is things go great or things blow up. I know I'm an entrepreneur, I've had lots of businesses fail, and and a few succeed and you need to have some kind of security behind you that enables you to take those risks with a little bit of a hammock, you know, behind you if something goes sideways. So do you have a rule of thumb of, of a percent of income or revenue that we should be pulling aside? No, for me, it's more about what are you trying to, what, what, what is it going to take for you to be secure and what do we have to do on a monthly basis to create that pool? And so if, if somebody's really got a hot hand right now and they're making a lot of money and it, maybe don't deploy all of it, maybe put 30, 40% away. If you're really struggling, you don't kill yourself, you know, put away a small amount, but try to be disciplined and always have something going off to that diversity bucket because ultimately all money is is a means to an end, whether it's your business that you're launching or that's mature or this pool of money. The point is to give you security and to do the freedom, uh, the freedom you, of what you want to do is pay for your future kid's school, take care of your family if you're gone, enjoy yourself in retirement, pay for a wedding. And so we have to have different approaches. We can't all be all in on the business only. If you're an entrepreneur, you'll never just be satisfied with the portfolio. But look at what you can take without compromising your business uh, off to the side to, to make progress towards being independent outside of your business. Got it. So everybody, the book is called The Path, Accelerating Your Journey to Financial Freedom. For the YouTube audience, we'll link that in the description below. You can go pick up your copy. For people who are, you talk about financial freedom. I mean, everybody, everybody wants it. There's nobody's yeah. going to say, I don't, I don't need financial freedom. Is it a lack of information, a lack of discipline, a lack of belief? Like what's the big problem you think? I think there's a lack of everything. So I think okay. first of all, we have a we have a lot of information. It's just not good information. So we have more information than ever before at our fingertips. Uh, and so it becomes hard to say, oh, you know, all I got to do is put away a small amount every month and buy a couple of indexes. And when I get to a certain level, hire an advisor. It's too simple. We're flooded with thousands of pieces of information that tell us it must be much more complicated than that. And I've got to be doing fancier things or crazier things or investing in my friend's idea and all of those things. And really, it's not it's not finding information. It's getting all this noise, all this excess information away from you and focusing only on the things that matter. I really tried to cover that in the path where, you know, with Tony uh, Robbins, he and I write about here are the things to focus on. Here are the building blocks. If you do these things, go do whatever else you want to do, but take care of these things and you'll be in great shape. I love it. So you're an author now, you know, I yeah. mean, you've I know you had one book a number of years ago, but you've kind of been heads down building your business and, and I mean, massive success, $55 billion assets under management with a crazy number. Why write books? Like what's the why <laughs> behind this book? This is not, you know, massively paying the bills. So why right. write books? What's the incentive? Well, I mean, the first one I wrote was five mistakes every investor makes and how to avoid them. And it was really just, hey, here are my thoughts on the stock market. And it was all about all the things we're talking about how to look at the market, how to invest in the market, how to get diversified, avoid the mistakes like timing. Uh, and then Tony and I wrote Unshakable, which you showed earlier, which was also all about the markets. But the reality is there's more to investing than the markets. There's also all these other issues like tax planning and how to set up a business and how to get money to uh, your family in the best way possible, how to make a charitable gift the smartest way possible. Do you need insurance? So I wrote The Path. Um, to talk about that, to say, look, it's not just about the money, which we wrote about last time. It's about all these aspects of wealth management, not just how to grow it, but how to protect it and how to transfer it uh, and everything in between. And so the path is more a playbook to wealth management, more the way a wealthy 
person or someone who aspires to be wealthy looks at things, money management, how you manage your money and your investments is just a piece of overall wealth management, as your viewers know. I mean, part of it's the big part of it's your business and some of it's your house and all these other pieces go together. And that's what we cover in the path. So if I'm, you know, under 50K, I'm, I'm buying the ETF, I'm buying the market, I'm trying to save as much as I can to have my nest egg kind of built up. When I'm ready to make that jump, I'm in that 50 to 100K range or maybe a little bit above, how do I know who to pick? How do I, everybody talks in fancy language and it's complicated and I think it's so much fear in the system. And I know, I know, you know Tony, you, you go against a lot of people in this book, how do I, <laughs> you know, tearing down the mutual fund industry and all of that. Like we've been taught that mutual funds are good. So, so how do I know who the person is to help me build my wealth plan? Like how do I identify that person? So basically what we want to do is we want to find somebody who doesn't have their own products to sell. So the financial services industry is really interesting. Like we would never go to a doctor who owns five medications and prescribes those medications all the time. Uh, but that is how financial services works. You pay somebody a percentage of what they're managing, and most advisors work for a company that then has their own investment products to sell you, whether it's their own mutual funds or alternative investments. So that's an inherent conflict of interest, and we want to avoid. you want to avoid that. You're more likely to get a better outcome if that conflict doesn't exist. So to really avoid that conflict, it helps to get an independent advisor. So there's, there's basically two kinds of advisors. There's a broker, and then there's an independent advisor. And working with an independent advisor really improves the probability you've got someone who has to be on your side of the table all the time and isn't just going to sell you an investment product. So are there other questions I should ask? I mean, one, uh, do you make any money from the things that, that you're selling is a good starting point. It is, like how else? I think just people are afraid. Yes. They don't know what to do. These people in the suits look like they know what they're talking about and they're driving the fancy cars. So they know something about money. And all I know is how to build my business. Like how else do I filter when I don't have domain expertise in yeah. financial services? Well, I think one big thing is competence is your, if you're getting planning, is the person a certified financial planner or is there a certified financial planner on the team? Like at our company, there's a certified financial planner on every team because we think someone's going to be giving financial planning advice to you they should be trained in it and have a designation in it. Uh, the second is conflict, you know, avoiding working with somebody who makes more money selling you one investment uh, over another. Uh, the other is custody. You don't ever want to give your money to somebody. Like if you're working with us at Creative Planning, we hold our clients' money to third party, like a Fidelity or Charles Schwab. That way you don't have to worry about the Bernie Madoff situation. Whereas if a friend is buying a strip mall and you go give that friend uh, money, that friend can then put it in their checking account and take it, and you're not going to know, right? And so giving up custody of your money can be dangerous uh, too. So fo focusing on things like competence, conflict, custody, that really narrows it down to where you're only looking at a few percent of, of the advisors and it becomes easier to make a decision. Got it. Going down the path of diversification a little bit, a lot of entrepreneurs when they're starting are starting to think of multiple streams of income, and, and a lot of people end up trying to build you know, 10 multiple streams of income, but none of them are paying off because they're just, their time is split too much. Yeah. Do you think investing, is it, do you think it's better, like just entrepreneur advice, is it better to start one business and focus on it and then take the money out to then diversify through the markets? Well, I think that business owners, entrepreneurs, they get this bug to start all kinds of businesses. And it's usually a mistake. Usually if you have an entrepreneur and they're running three or four things. There's one that really, really shows promise and makes a lot of sense. And, but they're spending maybe 25% of their time on four things and they should be spending 100% on one. Find the business where you're the most competitive, the most passionate. That's the one where you should be investing all your time and talent and, and treasure to make it get going and then build a diversified portfolio on the side. But try not to dilute your time and commitment to your business by opening other ones that don't contribute to your bottom line as much. And I, I kind of how I hear you're saying it is when I'm making my investment choices, I'm diversified, but I'm not having to spend a lot of my focus or energy on it because I'm either buying the market when I'm really staged, so I'm buying yeah. everything, or I'm giving it to a trusted advisor and they're running with it because they're the expert. So I just have faith that it's going to grow and I can focus my efforts back on my business. That's right. When you're invested in the portfolio and forget about it and get, get back to focusing your attention in your real wealth generator, which is your day job. What's the, 
question or line of thinking that kind of drives you the most nuts in this industry? Uh, the line of thinking that drives me the most nuts, I think that c- complexity is a key to success. I think the key mm-hmm. to success is really to make things as simple as possible and get those things done. So, for example, you don't need a big, complex insurance plan, even if you're a business owner. You probably don't need permanent life insurance or whole life insurance. You don't need an expensive policy. You probably need the cheapest, easiest insurance to get, which is term insurance policy, which would pay to your to your family or, or your partners if something happened to you and it costs very, very little. Uh, insurance agents don't make a lot of money on it, and that's why they tend not to sell it. So the simplest thing is the right solution. Same when it comes to investing in the stock market. The simplest thing is to buy an index. It also happens to be the best option. So I, the big, big problem in our industry is, is everything's made to be much more complex than it needs to be. And really, the good news for your viewers is hey, you're focused on your job and that's where your attention should be. Just know the fundamentals and do those fundamentals with your diversified portfolio and you'll be on the right track. So for people who pick up the path, and again, YouTube, link it in the description below. It's called The Path, Peter Malouk, Tony Robbins. Um, what do you hope is the action item that people take away? Because you know, you write a book, you want people to learn, obviously, but then to do something. So what do you hope is the action item they do after reading your book? First, I hope that when they read it, they go, wow, this is, you know, Peter and Tony did a good job of really simplifying things for me. I really understand this and I know what to do. So I'm just hoping that they feel like I finally get this and I know the four or five things I need to do to get my personal situation in order. And then I hope they go do those things. I hope they open the account and invest the type of investments we encourage them to, that they protect against uh, risks of disability and death and things that we talk about in the book, that they get basic estate planning done, like a healthcare power of attorney that says, who would make healthcare decisions for you if you couldn't make them for yourself. And really, they can get all that stuff done pretty quickly, and they'll be in a much, much better position than they were before they read the path. Got it. Um, I know we're kind of coming up against the clock. Maybe just a final message for people who are watching this, who they've been putting this off because they're afraid. It sounds complex. It sounds like all these terms that they don't want to think about, but they know they kind of need to. Otherwise, they won't live that financial freedom life and they're tired of they're like on the on the rat race of trying to bring money in all the time what piece of advice would you give them to kind of push them over the edge to say no this is important for you right now i think it's basically you think about in your business you spend thousands of hours trying to get it where it needs to be in any given year and we're talking about here maybe dedicating five hours so that the fruits of all of this time that you spent coming up with idea, investing in, building your business, leading people, coming up with a product, trying to compete those thousands and thousands of hours. For some, it's tens of thousands of hours. Now you spent five hours going, what do I do with the fruits of this? And I think it's five hours. I can't imagine getting a better return on your investment uh, than that. I love it. Peter Maluk in the house. The book is called The Path, Accelerating Your Journey to Financial Freedom. Check it out in the link below. Peter, thank you for the time, man, the knowledge, the care. It's been awesome having you here. Thanks, Evan. Appreciate you. If you want to see the one-on-one I did with Tony Robbins, check it out right there next to me. I think you'll enjoy it. Continue to believe, and I'll see you there. Tony, welcome aboard, man. Thanks, Evan. Great to be with you.